There was a man who had two sons. And with this short sentence, Jesus begins one of his longest stories that he tells in the gospel. And Jesus tells us these stories that we've come to know as parables to help us understand what God is like and to understand what the kingdom is like. Good morning, I'm Lisa, as Corey mentioned earlier. I am one of the pastors here in Oakville, and my job is to connect with our home church leaders in the town of Oakville as they help lead others in those home churches. I'm excited to spend time with you this morning as we head into one of these parables. Uh, in your Bible, it's probably called something like the lost son, the parable of the lost son, or the parable of the prodigal son. And I just want to take a look at the definition of the word prodigal for a moment before we move on. And it's characterized as being wasteful in spending, or in being lavish, or yielding abundantly. And so we're going to see this morning that this isn't just a story about the sons, this is a story about the father. And he is lavish, he is extravagant and he is abundant. So I pray that all the eyes of our hearts would be open this morning to hear what God's character is like for us and his love is for us. So if you wanna grab your Bibles, we're gonna head into Luke 15, which is where this story is found. And if you don't have one of your Bibles with you, just raise up your hand and the ushers are passing around visitor Bibles that you can use this morning. So as I mentioned, Jesus is telling this story along with a couple others as a response. The scriptures tell us that there are people labeled as sinners hanging around Jesus, and there's also a bunch of religious teachers and leaders, and these religious ones are saying, Jesus, if you're God, what are you doing hanging around with these sinners? If you're God, the God we know, he would not be hanging out with people like that. And Jesus tells this story to say, the God you think you know, this is what he's like. So we're gonna start in Luke 15, verse 11, which is where I already started, which it says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property among them. This is the first time we are seeing the father acting in a prodigal way. He yields abundantly to his son. He gives him what he asks for. Essentially though, this younger son is saying, dad, I wish you were dead. This money that I'm gonna be given, once you die, I want it right now. You know what, Dad? I don't really need you in my life anymore. How often are we like that? I know I have. My grandmother, who's now in her 90s, she likes to remind me of when I was a little girl, and during snack time, I would be reaching up to the cupboard to get something. Of course, I was too small, so she would be helping me to reach something from the cupboard, and I would wipe her hand out of the way and say, I can do this all by myself. I was raised in a church-going family. My grandfather was a pastor. But by the time I was in junior high, I wanted to fit in with a certain crowd. I wanted certain people to like me. And so I started to make decisions that really put a distance between me and God. Uh, by 16, a few challenging things had happened in my life, including the death of my grandfather. And I remember thinking, you know what? There is no God. Um, he's dead. I can do this all on my own. Ten years down the road, I remember thinking, this is the life I've always wanted on paper. You know, I had the job in my field of study as a journalist. I had a car, I had money, I got to go on vacations once a year. I was with a man that I assumed I was going to marry, yet I was wholly unsatisfied. I remember thinking, maybe God is the one thing that's missing. And I wouldn't have called it a prayer at the time, but I had a thought. Okay, God, I'm ready to hear what you have for me. So like in my own story, as we continue to read in this parable, the young son starts living the life he thinks he's always wanted. He goes to a distant land, unfortunately he loses all his money, and then there's a famine. It's almost as if he's left face to face with his choices, and then says, what was I thinking? So he decides to return to his father's house, and we read in verse 19, probably the son's biggest fear as he's returning home. His fear when he faces his dad is that he's gonna have to say, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Then we continue to read though, as he goes back to his father in verse 20, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. It's the second time we're seeing the father acting in a prodigal way. 
something totally uncharacteristic for a man of his status and in that time. Probably looked a little weird to see a pretty distinguished gentleman picking up the ends of his robe and running down the street to meet his son. But that's how much he loved him. And his biggest fear, the son's, is answered in verse 24, where the father says, for this son of mine was dead and is now alive. The son, he still has the identity. The father reinstates him right away. He labels him with his true identity as son. So regardless of how we behave, God is like this father who looks for us, comes after us, embraces us, welcomes us, and reinstates us. Our status as his child does not change. In fact, this father, he starts lavishly putting gifts on his son. He gives him the robe, the ring, the sandals, the best of his best is given to the son, and that best thing is his title, that he is still the son. C. Baxter Kruger, in his retelling of this parable, puts it this way. He says, this is about a son who is and remains a son because he has a father who is and remains a father. This is about a son encountering the truth that he has a home, that he has a father, that he has an inheritance that he cannot squander. This is about coming to know God, coming to know and believe the good news of God the Father's immutable heart. And that is good news. The word immutable means that God's heart is unchanging towards us, and we see that in this story. The father doesn't ask for a payment plan. He's not asking for his son to make amends in any way. In fact, he just says, let's have a party. You're back. Let's celebrate. In the King James Version, instead of saying celebrate, it says, let's be merry. Sounds very jolly. It comes from the Greek word, euphrino. So you, meaning glad or joyful, and friend, meaning in the gut, really deep inside. An English word that you might be familiar with that sounds like this is euphoric. It's this great elation, joy and happiness deep in the core of our being. It's the kind of joy that's infectious. Everybody else wants to be around it. That's the kind of celebration that's happening. In your notes, you'll see there's three other uh, passages listed there. I just want to highlight the one in Revelation. It's talking about what this kind of celebration in God's presence looks like. And in Revelation 19, it says that there is a great multitude shouting. So this is a loud party. It says there's fine linens at this party. So it's beautiful. And then an angel says, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. So this is the kind of celebration you want in on. That is, unless, of course, you are someone who doesn't think that everyone deserves to have a party, or not everybody deserves to be invited to this kind of party. And as we pick up in verse 25, we're going to read about that very kind of person. In verse 25, it says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So when the older brother asks, what's going on inside? He finds out, that this party is for his younger brother who's gone off, wasted his money, and now come back home, and they're throwing a party for him. The older brother, very angry, doesn't want to go into the party. And then we hear that the father, again, does something in a prodigal way. He leaves the fun to go find out what's up with his older son. He does something out of character, like who would leave their own party? <laughs> The older son complains, hey dad, I have been with you all along. I followed all your rules. I did everything you wanted, and you never let me throw a party like this. He's complaining. And some of you may have heard our, last, our speaker last week, Ken Shigematsu, and he talks about this type of person. We're, we're trying to be the guy, or we're trying to be the girl that we think everybody else expects of us. But really, we can't work for this kind of title. We've already been given the best identity and the best title possible. We are a son. We are a daughter. We are a child of God. And that's exactly what the father says to this older son in verse 31. He says, my son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. The father loves those who believe they are doing all the right things. And Jesus reminds us, that God's grace and, the access to, and access to what the Father has is for everybody. So can you let the Father celebrate? Can you let the Father celebrate for you if you identify as the younger son? 
Can you let the Father celebrate for others? And are you willing to join in on this celebration, like the older son is being asked? So whether you identify with the younger son or with the older son, the truth is, like I said, that our identity is that of a child of God. Now we don't know how this story ends. Jesus leaves it hanging. But what we can do is we can make a choice whether we want to choose to trust or not to trust in this lavish, abundant, and extravagant father who loves you. So I have a question for us this morning to ponder. We're gonna have the music team come back out and we're gonna take some time to reflect on this and I'm gonna paint a picture for us to go on a little journey together. But the question is, will you let the Father embrace you? For some of you, this is a familiar embrace. You know the Father's love. You go there often. And so I invite you again this morning to really sink into that love because you know it well. And for others, this is a really new concept that the Father would actually love you, choose you, and wants to make you his own. And so I invite you to be brave this morning and allow God to speak that to your heart and your spirit and your mind. So if you're brave, close your eyes, and we're gonna go on a little visual journey together as the music team comes out. So picture yourself, and you're on a road, and you see it laid out in front of you. It's a familiar road. You've been on it before. You know where it leads. It leads to a safe home. And in the distance, you see a really tiny figure. And as it approaches and gets bigger, you recognize it. It is your heavenly father. What do his eyes look like? What's the expression on his face? And as he comes in closer to give you a hug, by what name does he call you? And allow yourself to enter into that embrace of the Father. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you remind us what the love of the Father is like. And I pray that as we take time to sit and reflect and just let you embrace us and bring us into your perfect love, that we would allow that whether it's a familiar feeling or an unknown feeling, I just ask Jesus that you would give our hearts, our minds, and our spirits an ability to know you more. Amen. Let's go back and picture again in that image that Lisa led us to. I want you just to picture that in your mind again. God is loving you just for who you are because you're you. You're his kid. In your visualization, you might have seen yourself as a son or a daughter, a baby or an adult. What was it like to imagine yourself being loved by God, the Father? Was it an, ah, more, Lord? Or was it a, this is uncomfortable, I'm not used to this? Or was it a situation where you felt like, I, I really don't know how to go there. I need help with this. Or maybe I don't want to go there because I'm afraid of fathers. Depending on how we experienced our biological dads, each one of us will have a different ability to feel the love of a heavenly father as well as a father of three sons and two grandchildren, I have been fathered. And I remember him with pride and gratitude. My father was a pastor. And I was proud of his compassion for marginalized people, some of whom came to live with us in our home from time to time. A refugee, a blind man dying with HIV AIDS, a depressed relative, a friend at times who was in hard times himself, a homeless guy. Dad had a big heart for struggling people. And thankfully, I caught that. We caught that as a family. Though compassionate, though, he was absent at times. And even when present, was lost in a magazine or sometimes just not there and really with us. There's so much on his mind. 
So I have memories that are mixed of the dad I loved and wish I could have known him better before his home going just over a year ago. Anna, who was just leading us in worship, experienced a loving father who is now with his heavenly father. Let's listen to her experience in her story. I grew up in an awesome family with two parents and two older sisters, much older as I would joke, who loved me very much unconditionally. Also growing up as a pastor's kid, I got to learn about God and his love for me. But the older that I got, I realized that I didn't really understand what that meant on a personal level. And as I got older, I became more broken in the lack of a relationship with God until I reached a point where I needed to hear God say he loved me. I'm Anna. I absolutely love music. I love vacations in the sun. I am not a winter person. If it could be summer, 24 hours, 365 days a year, that would make me a very happy person. My dad was a pastor and uh, a musician. We would love to sit and sing with him. And he had a really cool knack of making each of us feel like we were special and unique. He was everything to us. It sounds silly to say, to put that much into one person, but he was the one that we went to with our problems and to lose him felt like we were losing a big part of our lives. I felt the loss of a very special relationship. I felt the lack of love in that sense. I think even as a kid, I was always drawn to music. Um, I knew that I could sing and I uh, was very quickly affirmed by others that this was a gift and felt like this was my way to get closer to God. I saw opportunities come up in church. Uh, we were a, quite a big church and so there was opportunities within youth or young adults or even Sunday mornings to, to lead. And as much as I saw what I wanted, it never seemed within my grasp. Every time that I made steps forward to follow a dream or to say, this is what I want to do, I always felt like doors kept shutting in my face. I just, I guess I felt like I tried to attain something and I felt like I was doing all the right things to get there. I was a good person. I was a good Christian. I read my Bible. I was extremely involved in all areas. And yet it didn't matter what box I checked off, it wasn't enough. It felt like it was never enough. And yeah, I got to a place of saying, I can't do this anymore. I am tired of feeling like on the inside, I feel rejected and never good enough. I feel like I'm a hot mess. And yet I'm constantly trying to portray someone to everybody else that's perfect, that has it together, that is good enough and I got to a place almost like a breaking point where I couldn't take it anymore. And I remember just having a real honest moment with God and saying, I know you're there, but I don't know you. And I almost gave God an ultimatum that night, that feeling of God, I will give you everything and I will open my heart up and my life up to who you are. And I will be obedient to listen to you but in return, I need to know that you love me. And had a night of watching God come in and wash away all of the garbage that I had kept inside for so long. All of that pain, all of even the grieving of, of not really being able to let go that I didn't have a physical dad anymore, the, the feelings of rejection. I watched God wash that away and in its place give me such a peace um, that I'll never be able to put words to.
As I was laying there with my eyes closed, I saw a picture of two eyes with fire in them. And I remember being startled, thinking, what is this? And hearing so clearly for the first time God say to me, this is my love that burns for you. And in that moment, it was the first time I understood what it meant to be his kid. That it wasn't about a checklist of things I needed to do for him. That at the end of the day, my identity wasn't found in being a perfect pastor's daughter or being the best worship leader or even in my singing abilities. At the core of who I was, my identity was found in being his kid. And that's all I needed in that moment. And for the first time, I understood his love. That was the night I, I finally sat in front of my keyboard and wrote my first song called A Father's Love. What an amazing connection Anna had with her dad and struggled and developed that with her Heavenly Father. Many of us have that kind of relationship with a dad who is good and that has helped us to come to a connection with our Heavenly Father. We can imagine a loving father like him, but really most of us have had mixed experiences like that and it's a little bit more difficult for us to get there to connect with a heavenly father because of our experience of our earthly father. Our dads are humans, graced by God with gifts and abilities, but also wounded by all kinds of factors which they pass along to us inadvertently. Predictably, I have some very similar traits to my dad. For some, your experience of your dad was really hard and something you wanna forget you can't picture a loving father because your dad may have been an alcoholic or violent or hypercritical or absent or unfaithful. And having had a broken experience of a father, we often project that onto God and God gets the blame and we, we don't connect with him very well. God must be like that too, we think. What about you? Can you look back over your life and say, God has been a good father to me. If not, your heart is hurting and your image of God needs healing. And that healer is Jesus. Why? Because Jesus it reveals in human form the clear picture of God our Father. No one has ever put a human face on the invisible God, our Father God, like his son. Jesus. Though he wasn't a father himself, Jesus reflects Almighty God as Abba Father, our Father. Abba Father is a term of endearment that's used by Jesus for his Father. No human has ever addressed God like that before. God's name, Yahweh, commanded respect and fear such as the people of Israel would not even utter that name, had to use a different name for him, and certainly not one like Abba. But God represented himself to us through a child, humble, God with us. He was the exact representation of God who is a spirit who cannot be contained in pictures or words, but really came in a human form for us. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. And Colossians 1 15, the sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. We catch glimpses of Jesus growing up as a beloved son in the gospels. Concerning his earthly father, Joseph, we don't have a lot of information, except that Joseph was a righteous man, a man of integrity and faithfulness to Jesus' mother, Mary. I think Jesus had a good relationship with his dad. Yet, he felt heard and experienced God's favor or approval throughout his development directly 
from his heavenly Father. We see this in the Gospels. In Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 40, it's recorded that he heard it through Simeon and Anna's testimony in the temple when he was brought there as an infant. And later in the passage as an adolescent, he affirmed that connection as his priority when his parents came to look for him because he was behind doing his father's work. Did you not know I must be in my father's house about my father's business? My father's business said to his earthly father. We hear the father's blessing on him as a young adult of 30 when he's baptized in Luke chapter 3. And the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Many months later we hear it again at the transfiguration in Mark chapter 9. This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 to 30. This is a familiar passage, one that's well loved. And yet there are some interesting things that we see in this passage about Jesus and his relationship with his father. He's disappointed at the unbelief in the villages that he's just been visiting, and he breaks out into prayer and says, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Jesus saw the Father through childlike eyes. With all that curiosity and freedom to explore and ask questions, to learn from his parent, to listen to his stories and tell them again, to develop trust and confidence and a willingness to obey. This is the childlike spirit that he calls us to bring to God if we're to be his beloved. The father yearns for his children to know him for who he really is. An awesome father who invites us through the life of Jesus, to experience his father love. If you explored the Gospels, looking at the passages where Jesus refers to my father or your father to the disciples, in your notes I've listed some of the kind of conclusions you would draw about what Father God is like. Jesus saw his father as a strong, authoritative leader, not authoritarian to be afraid of, but one who commands respect to be obeyed and to be followed and trusted. Jesus caught that, and we see that repeatedly in the way he taught, the way he handled himself. He saw his father as a wise teacher, and so was Jesus. And that was reflected in the way that he taught people, and he he was seen by all the people. They said, wow, we've never heard teaching like, like this before. Potent parables, stories, Sermon on the Mount. One after the other, we saw an amazing teacher. He was a present hide and ge- guide and helper. Hide and gelper. There you go. His father was always available. And they routinely conversed about all kinds of things. Like in this passage, he would just pray out at any time to his father. Whenever there was a situation he wanted consultation on. And sometimes would pray all night. He was a caring provider, Father was. Jesus had nothing, but lacked nothing. He trusted his Father to provide. And when he sent out his disciples, he did the same thing for them. He said, don't take anything with you. I will provide. Rely on me. He saw his Father as a responsive problem solver. Whatever the issue, Jesus knew his Father had it covered whether it was feeding the crowds, raising someone from the dead, healing an illness, place to stay, routine things for the father. Abba Father was on it. He saw his dad as an alert protector. 
whether he was being tempted in the wilderness or escaping certain death by walking through a crowd that was after his hide, whether it was the timing of his suffering, Jesus knew that his father had his back. And he faced huge challenges as a beloved son, even in suffering and death. However, he did not blame his father, but submitted to God's plan, letting his father be God. Abba, Father, he cried in Mark 14. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Finally, he saw his father as a compassionate caregiver. And we experience that compassionate heart of Abba, Father, repeatedly in the way Jesus encountered people. Jesus listened well. He responded non-judgmentally. He attended to their needs for healing, for deliverance, for teaching, for kindness. The Father is inviting us to be childlike again, to be teachable, to be humble, to be open to Him. We can know Abba Father and experience Him through knowing Jesus, His Son, the one who gave everything for us. The Father gives us our true identity, his kids, his child. He wants us to be embraced and to embrace that identity as uniquely, deeply loved children. I want to leave you with some questions. And you can work through these questions in home church, or if you're not in a home church, find one. And connect with God, your Father. And do it on your own, or meet with your soulmate or a friend to do these questions. How is Jesus revealing the Father love of God to you? How are you listening to him and allowing him to teach you as a child? his beloved? How is he giving you rest from having to be God instead of letting the Father be God? How is he training you to carry your yoke, to make it easy or at least easier? Sit with that for a moment and I'm going to pray. Abba, Father, we are grateful for your son, Jesus, who reveals you to us in such amazing ways. And we ask you, Jesus, to reveal Abba, Father, to us. Help us come to know what the Father is really like, who he is to us. Forgive us for just relying on our life experience rather than learning from you, the son who knew his father best. Give us a childlike openness to learn from you, to receive the yoke that you give us and to find rest in your arms. Stir up your Holy Spirit within us, crying out, Abba, Father, And help us to receive all that we need from you in this life and in the one to come. Amen.